Wednesday, we started talking about uh, systems which have pi bonds, which, which when placed adjacent to each other, form these conjugated systems, or, or systems where a, a p orbital exists on every carbon along the chain in a system. So a diene, for example, um, butadiene. If the two double bonds are in the one and three position, you have a, a p orbital on every carbon. And so in that case, the electrons are not just localized in each double bond. The electrons, in this case, two double bonds, four electrons in the pi system will be spread out among four carbons. Okay? And that actually has some impacts in the structure, stability, and chemistry uh, that these things undergo. Um, if you have a system which is not conjugated, uh, there's areas in between isolating those double bonds so that there is no, none of that communication between the two pi systems. Um, and we saw that that has impacts on physical properties as well in terms of the wavelengths of light that it absorbs. Um, and when we have orbitals which are empty or orbitals which are filled but not bonded like a lone pair or that are partially filled like a free radical, and if those are adjacent to a pi bond, a double bond, one or more double bonds, then it gains stability by delocalizing across all that whole system. And so even though a lone pair, which we learned early on, like a lone pair on oxygen, exists in a hybrid orbital, right? Because it takes up electronic space. Um, if it can spread out to a double bond, then it will be in a p orbital, and then be a part of this whole pi system. Uh, and that has impacts, uh, that because charges, like plus charges, minus charges, and free radicals are stabilized by being spread out, um, that has impacts on the bond strengths in the allylic position, right? Not only for carbon-hydrogen bonds, as I showed here, uh, but also for um, carbon-halogen bonds, if we use those as electrophiles in substitution chemistry. Um, or in SN2 or SN1 chemistry, that uh, double bond actually increases the reactivity because the intermediates that are formed or the bond strength uh, changes because of the presence of the double bond. Okay? Um, and remember, we talked a little bit about free radical halogenation. Um, and in an alkane, there's some selectivity between primary, secondary, and tertiary hydrogens uh, just because a tertiary radical would be more stable than a secondary more stable than a primary, but there's a greater preference for forming radicals at allylic positions. And so if you do free radical halogenation of systems which have double bonds, it's positions that are allylic that will be brominated or chlorinated when you do those reactions. Um, and we also talked about another type of uh, multi or a polyene system where the double bonds are not separated by a single bond in between where they're adjacent right next to each other. So in the accumulated double bond system, in that case, there's no way for the two pi bonds to be in the same plane. It's impossible because in order to have a carbon with a pi bond in each direction, those p orbitals have to be orthogonal at that middle carbon. It has to be sp hybridized. Um, and so there is no communication there because they're 100, uh, 90 degrees apart. Um, so we gain some stability from having conjugation versus non-conjugated. Um, and since these double bonds actually are not conjugated with each other in an alene or accumulated double bond, a diene system, it also doesn't gain that extra stability. And we saw that when we looked at the energetics of hydrogenation for um, alkene systems. So if we look at, just to remind you, if we look at one pentene, a double bond at the end of a, ch end of a chain where it's just monosubstituted, and you hydrogenate that, um, it releases 126 kilojoules per mole. If it's an internal double bond, that is a disubstituted double bond, we get a little stability with that, it's 115 kilojoules per mole, it's about uh, around the same range. Um, a double bond, or two double bonds, so if you have a terminal alkene, and then now you have a molecule with two terminal alkenes, essentially would be double that, right? 
the energy of that pi bond and that pi bond are the same as it would be as just taking two isolated ones and hydrogenating them. Um, but if the double bonds are in conjugation, we actually gain less. I mean, uh, we gain less energy out in this hydrogenation reaction because the molecule is at a lower energy already. It's more stable. That difference, uh, instead of being double 115, we, there's a few kilojoules per mole extra stability gained by that double bond being conjugated with the other one. Okay, so it's not just the additive effect of um, a terminal alkene 126 plus an er internal alkene 115, right? That would be what, 230, 241? And overall we have uh, something like 227, 226, right? So that shows you that there's some extra stability gained by this conjugation. <clears throat> um, and just to remind you, the alene, actually it's, it's a little bit less stable than two isolated double bonds. Um, and we can see in the heat hydro hydrogenation of propane, which is now about 30 kilocalories per mole. If it were just two double bonds being hydrogenated, it'd be 60 kilocalories per mole, right? Double that. But actually, it's a little bit higher in energy than that, 70 kilocalories per mole upon hydrogenation. So actually, the, these, these um, cumulated double bonds are actually less stable than normal double bonds. They tend to be more reactive. And we see that show up in chemistry as well. Uh, there's another aspect to uh, diene and alkene stability. And that has to do with um, whether the double bonds are arranged in a particular conformation. And here's a couple more terms for you. By the way, if you have the notes, I actually had these labels switched. So that was wrong in the original notes. I fixed it on the web now today when I noticed that, but just to make you aware, that was wrong in the original notes. Um, we refer to a double bond, depending on how they are related conformationally with each other, um, as either an S-trans conformation or an S-cis conformation. Don't confuse that with cis and trans double bonds. We use that same term, but we're not really talking about a fixed system. We're talking about a conformation. And it has to do with uh, this single bond in between the two double bonds, right? You could envision that double bond rotating, all right? Um, but if you recall, uh, if we consider these, these uh, pi bonds as being connected, right? Oops, sorry, that's not where I wanted to do that. Down here. Let's see this trans conformation. If you think about those double bonds as being all connected across all four carbons, right? That's, that single bond in between isn't that easy to rotate, okay? Because the p orbitals that are there, the p orbital on this one and this one, also have some connection or communication or some overlap, right? So there's actually a, a, a pretty significant barrier to rotation if you go from what we call an S-trans conformation, where the two double bonds are sort of in this S-open orientation, or if you rotate that bond where they're now in this more closed uh, orientation. This is higher in energy because you start to bump into each other, the groups that are up here, okay? So those hydrogens start to come closer. Those ends come closer. So that's why this cis conformation is higher in energy than the trans conformation. Uh, but you'll notice if you just, if you rotate, if you start to rotate the two double bonds away from each other, what happens to the communication between the two pi bonds? You have to break that communication. Okay, so you have to break the overlap between the p orbitals here that are uh, on either side of that single bond. So what it results is if you just map the energy as you rotate from one of these conformations to the other, you go to a, a orientation where the p orbitals now are orthogonal or 90 degrees apart. So it actually goes up higher in energy and then down as you rotate those bonds. Okay, it's significant energy. 
Uh, at room temperature, it happens pretty readily. It's about four kilocalories per mole, or 16 kilojoules per mole. At room temperature, that's probably <coughs> rotating pretty fast. Uh, but if you were to cool this down um, to some low temperature, then you could freeze out those conformations and prevent that rotation. Okay, but just keep in mind this S cis conformation, although with just butadiene and no substitution here at room temperature, they are interconverting quite rapidly. Um, and we will see a little bit later that uh, reactions of dienes can depend on which conformation the, the orientation of those two double bonds are in. Okay, there are some reactions that can only occur if it's in this particular conformation. Okay. So let's talk about how we make them. And hopefully this is not too much of a surprise. We make dienes by elimination reactions. Um, elimination reactions we've talked about all along for making alkenes. There just happens to be another double bond there. Or the ability to do two eliminations, right? Um, so remember if we had systems where we could do two eliminations to make a triple bond, we could do two eliminations of two different groups that would form double bonds. Um, but I will point out, this could be done either from an alcohol, oh, where's my pen? Either from an alcohol under the acid catalyzed conditions, which we learned about uh, quite a while ago now, or through an E2 elimination of um, an alkyl halide with a strong base, like KOH or something, or alkoxide. But notice, I want you to notice something here. What's formed when we do these kinds of eliminations is a double bond which is conjugated. Okay, the diene that we form, if there's already one double bond here, the elimination is always taking place in that direction. Even though the leaving group is not next to there, either from the acid catalyzed conditions or the base catalyzed conditions, it's going to eliminate to form the conjugated double bond. The alternative, right, the alternative to this would be deprotonating from this position. If you deprotonate from that position, for example, okay, let's say we take that hydrogen off, we would form a different diene. We would form a non-conjugated diene. Okay, so a double bond there and a double bond there. Those double bonds are not uh, next to each other. Okay, there's a sp3 carbon in between here and here. So that's not not conjugated. All right. Uh, the important point here is that either one of these mechanisms, acid catalyzed mechanism or base uh, into elimination, that reaction will occur to form the more stable conjugated double bond because that is that would be more stable than the non-conjugated. It's the same thing. I mean, same principle when we think about uh, double bonds forming less substituted or more substituted upon elimination, right? We generally form more of the more substituted. Why? Because it's the, the, it's the more stable product. All right? And that's the case here as well. So the major product is just going to be the... This, this, the conjugate will be the major product, and uh, depending on the, the specifics, you could have maybe a little bit of the other one or, or exclusively the conjugate. The conjugate will definitely be the major product. Um, of course, if uh, instead of the bromine being in this position, for example, the bromine were here, okay, and this were a hydrogen, then that elimination could only give the conjugated one. That would work to make the diene as well. That, that would also give the same product. Um, and so you can, you can think about all kinds of different ways to get um, the formation of a diene by elimination. The chemistry is nothing new. E2 elimination or acid catalyzed E1 elimination of alcohols. Uh, there's nothing new at all in terms of how the chemistry works. It's just that there's another double bond there. Or the ability to form two at once. Let's say, I'll give you an example, like uh, if we had this, okay? If we had that dibromide, uh, we could form that diene, right? We could eliminate here from this direction and from this direction with some base. That would give the same product. 
So there's lots of ways in which you can get to the same, same kind of dying system in here. Uh, this, okay, now let's think about multi-step synthesis. You could make this from what? What would you make a dibromide from? Br2 plus an alkene, right? So that could be made from, let's say that. <coughs> so keep in mind the, all the chemistry we're learning, think, think about how to connect them all together in series to be able to manipulate and change functional groups and where they are. <coughs> That's the whole point of learning these reactions. KOH and the Br, that would be uh, you would need to assume something else. Okay, what about reactions of dienes? Um, again, the chemistry is not going to be a whole lot different than the types of reactions we talked about with alkenes. Um, except that when, when you have a diene and you do HCl addition, for example, um, we do have some issues on where carbocations are formed. Okay, so if you take if you take a system which is conjugated like that cyclohexadiene here, right? And you add H plus. Let's say we add H plus from HCl to the double bond. You can add on either end, in principle, on either end of the double bond, right? If the hydrogen adds, uh, I'll just write it here. If the hydrogen adds to this carbon, that leaves this one empty. So the plus charge would be there. That would be what would give rise to this product if the Cl minus then added, right? That's not formed. Why isn't that formed? <coughs> That's a less stable carbocation. <laughs> if we were to add the proton to the other end of the double bond, guess what? That puts the plus charge next, so the proton ends up there, that puts the plus charge next to the double bond. It's now an allylic carbocation. Okay, an allylic carbocation. That's the more stable carbocation. Just like if you have primary versus secondary, you're going to form the secondary carbocation. Here, if you have secondary versus secondary allylic, you're going to form the secondary allylic carbocation because that's more stable. The principle is exactly the same. Now we just have another issue of the double bond leading to different stability in the product. Okay, so the only product which is formed upon addition of an equivalent of HCl would be the product where the chlorine adds in the allylic position because the intermediate that's formed is the most stable. Okay. Um, and that will be true, that's always going to be the more stable when you have systems like this. Allylic is a, a very stable system. Um, I want to take a look at this now. I've shown you cyclohexadiene. Here's the open chain conjugated diene, butadiene, 1,3-butadiene. And if we do the addition of HBr, uh, we see the exact same thing. You add the proton to form the intermediate, which is now conjugated with the plus charge with the pi bond, okay? So in this initial, uh, okay, in this initial reaction, you protonate, uh, I guess I'll draw it up here. That'll form that carbocation, so the proton will highlight added on the end, okay? So you see where the proton went, where the plus charge was? That plus charge is the most stable one, adding to one of these double bonds. And, of course, that's where the bromide adds to give this product on the left. But there's another product. It's not the product of the other protonation, right? If we protonate it here and put the plus charge there, that's a much higher energy process. It doesn't happen relative to the other one. But that would give... Uh, the product where the bromine adds on the end. Is that the product I've shown on the right? No. The double bond's in a different place. 
Okay, and this is not formed. Okay, that carbocation is too high in energy. What, how do we get that other product then? Yes, it's not a rearrangement, it's a res the resonance form. Remember, once we have an allyl carbocation, this isn't the static structure which exists. It's a resonance, oh sorry, there's not a lot of room to write here. Uh, it's in a resonance with that structure. Okay, notice the double bond moved to the middle in that resonance form. What it means is, of course, that there is plus charge on both of those. Now it's no longer symmetric. In the top case, this cyclohexadiene, when you protonate, forms a symmetric molecule. So it doesn't, you can't tell the difference between those because they're identical, right? Although the plus charge is existing on both sides of that. Here now, it's no longer symmetric. Once you add that proton, you have a CH3 group, right? That allylic carbocation no longer is symmetric here and here. And so you form two different products. Okay. Notice that the ratio of products depends a lot on the temperature you carry out this reaction. Okay, that's an important observation. If you do this at a very low temperature, minus 80 degrees, what you see is that 81% of the product is um, the 2 bromo, I'm uh, sorry, that would be 1, 2, 3 bromo, 1 butene. And 19% of the product is the other regioisomer, okay, where the bromine and the double bond are switched. All right? Um, as you do this reaction at warmer temperature, at room temperature, 25 degrees, it's closer to a 50-50 mixture of the two products. And at 45 degrees, you're getting mostly the product on the right and a little bit of the product on the left. Interesting, huh? Um, what is controlling the ratio? Why does it change? Quite, yes. Maybe as the temperature increases, there is a, there are possibilities of a free radical addition. No, it's not free radical addition, but it's a good thought. Uh, did anyone hear that? Perhaps when you raise the temperature, maybe there are free radicals. No, it's all um, ionic reactions, so it's forming a carbocation and then bromine adding. Uh, the difference is that, uh, and I will say, um, let me just say if you, let me clean this up here. If you take this product and heat it up under these, if you can just take a product and heat it up under the reaction conditions, it converts to that. What does that tell you about the reaction? That addition of bromine is actually reversible. Okay, what's happening is reforming the carbocation and then forming the other product. What the difference is is that, uh, and I'll show you the transition. I'll show you the energy diagram in a moment. Um, it's on the next slide. But this is what we refer to as the kinetic product. It's the one which has formed the fastest. It's the reaction which has the lowest energy pathway. Uh, kinetics refers to reaction rates, so we refer to that as the kinetic product. This one is referred to as the thermodynamic product. That is, it's the more stable product. It's lower in energy. Well, obviously this bromine is more crowded on the secondary carbon than it is on the primary carbon. The double bond here on the end is monosubstituted, this one's disubstituted. So overall, this is the lower energy product more stable product. So if you are able to have an equilibrium established, an equilibrium, if, it can, if the reaction is reversible, it's always going to funnel to the more stable product. And that's what's happening here. At low temperature, there's no equilibrium, so this one is reacting about four times faster than this one, and so you're getting about a four to one ratio. Okay. But as you warm up and go to higher temperature, then you get an equilibrium. So this one can convert back to the carbocation and then to this more stable product. So the, resonance, the speed of the resonance increases. Not the resonance increases. We're talking about equilibrium now of the product to, to the carbocation. Let me show you the energy diagram. It might make it a little more clear about what's happening in this reaction. 
So here's the reaction energy diagram for this process in your, uh, this is right from your book. So starting with the dyne, uh, you still have this high activation energy, that's the rate deuterium step, to form the allylic carbocation. And, that, and this way of representing it, again, is saying there's plus charge on either end. Those two resonance extremes are just uh, the, the descriptions of what's lying in the middle somewhere. Uh, and what you can see is that uh, for addition of the bromine, the bromide to the, the secondary carbon, which would lead to this product, uh, notice that that's the lower energy path from that intermediate, okay? Uh, a higher energy path would be to add to the primary uh, side of this, okay, to give this other product. Now, it just happens that this other product is lower in energy than the more substituted growing product. So even though this is higher in energy, if the pathway is easier to get to, you're going to form more of that if your reaction is not reversible. But if this has the ability to go back, if you provide enough heat energy, this has the ability to go back to the intermediate and then down to the other path. And as long as those are going back and forth, you're going to reach just whatever the thermodynamic ratio, depending on their difference in energy is. Okay. Does that make sense? I know it's a little complicated. Uh, but it is important to recognize that not always is the most stable product. Now, when we talk about st most stable intermediates, those are going to be the fastest for the rate determining step. But not always is the most stable product the most major product. It depends on the reaction conditions a lot of times. Kinetic reactions, if this is faster and there's no way, not enough energy to go back, you'll get more of that. If you provide enough energy so that this is in, in equilibrium, then you'll get the more stable. <coughs> okay, so those are two more terms for you. Lots of terms to learn in this class. Kinetic product, thermodynamic product. So the PR is going to add to the thermodynamic product because that thermodynamic product is much more stable. That's right. So the, the, so the ratio is just going to depend on the energy difference between those two products. Yeah. Right. Okay, uh, another reaction which we saw with double bonds, uh, we can also do with conjugated systems. So if you add Br2 to this, you also see a mixture of products. Okay, you see a mixture of products. Now this is interesting because this gives you uh, two different products for the same reason. Um, and notice, uh, and I don't want to spend too much time on addition of Br2, but uh, if you think about the mechanism we talked about for Br2 before, right? You add uh, to the bromine, you get a, a bridged intermediate, so you can make a bromonium. Sorry, like R, okay. All right. You can make that, and, and if you just have an isolated double bond, because the bromine has those extra electrons and can bridge, that's better than forming a carbocation. But now, once you have a, <coughs> a, a position which is next to a double bond, this carbocation is actually not that bad. It's more stable than just a simple secondary carbocation, and then you have two resonance forms for this, oops, I haven't put that on yet, that should be a plus. And then, so then you can have two different products, depending on where that plus charge is. So keep in mind that the reason these things form these bromonium or chloronium uh, cyclic structures before was because that was more stable than having the carbocation in the halide, because you have electrons there which can help. But if you stabilize that enough, then this is okay. And that's what we see reflected um, in the product. So uh, just remember that in the bromination with Br2, uh, you can actually see the two different products from the two different resonance forms of the carbocation. Okay. 
I think probably the most important reaction of dying systems is this one. This is a reaction which we refer to as the deals all the reaction. Now here's something new for you. This is a reaction uh, which we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the details. And it is one of the most important reactions in organic chemistry to make six-membered rings. Okay, and, and the reaction occurs by taking a conjugated diene. I've shown just simply butadiene here, 1,3-butadiene. Combining that with another alkene, and notice in, in this system there is one, two, three, four, four carbons of the butadiene and two carbons from another double bond, that's making up the six carbons of the ring. Okay, so you just simply take those two things together, heat them up, you get the formation of the six-membered cyclohexene. So what has changed from the left to the right is, um, let me clear this. So here we have two pi bonds and a single bond, and here we have a pi bond. In the product, um, this pi bond here is a new pi bond between the middle two carbons. Uh, the pi bond that was here, here, and here originally are gone, and we formed these two new single bonds. Okay, and we'll talk about the, the details of this. Um, this reaction is so important that this is one of the main methods for making cyclohexenes and using for organic synthesis. Um, and won the Nobel Prize in 1950 and named after, after Otto Diels and his student, uh, Kurt Alder, who worked in his laboratory, who, who discovered this reaction. Um, you'll notice I didn't just use a simple alkene also. Uh, there are some fine details to this that having electron withdrawing groups on there, on this portion of the molecule uh, partner, reacting partner, that is important. And a little bit more detail about this. Um, the reaction proceeds in a single step. So if we look at those reacting partners, you can rationalize how the reaction proceeds by looking at the six electrons in the pi bond. So uh, let's see. There are two electrons, if we count up the electrons, two electrons in that pi bond, two electrons in that pi bond, and two electrons in that pi bond. <coughs> and if you think about those electrons just flowing, okay, these two electrons move to form a new single bond, okay. What happens is this carbon then is empty of electrons, and those electrons go between here. That, that carbon then has to be, the electrons here have to be pushed away. So if you take those two electrons and move them up here, to form a single bond. That pushes those two electrons here, which fills that empty hole that was left there. So you think about this. This describes how the electrons flow in this system. Notice all the pi bonds break. Two new single bonds are formed, and a new pi bond is formed in between there. Okay? It happens all in one step. Both the what, what is very interesting about this reaction is that both of the carbon-carbon single bonds to tie to make the ring are being formed at the same time. Okay, it's not stepwise. This is what we refer to as a pericyclic reaction when we have all of this is involved in the pi systems, um, and uh, this kind of reaction is referred to as a cycloaddition. So we've, we're adding two things together to make a ring. And we're making a ring because we're forming two bonds at once. It's a really fascinating reaction. Um, some terminology associated with this. Uh, some is relatively straightforward. Your conjugated diene is referred to as the diene. Okay, not too much of a stretch, right? Uh, the reacting partner, the other double bond, which reacts to make the six-membered ring is referred to as the dienophile. And then remember, dienophile is just one pi bond. The diene is two pi bonds. 
and those all come together to make a six atom ring. Really interesting reaction. Um, I have more details of this. So there are a number of different kinds of dienes and dienophiles which participate in this reaction. But they do have to be electronically paired. And you'll notice, if you look at all these examples I have on this slide, uh, here I'm just using 1,3-butadiene as the diene. But look at the different kinds of dienophiles I can use. I can use, um, if you just use ethene, the reaction is not that easy to do. But if you have, uh, let's say, an ester group or a, a nitrile, a CN, triple bond, or here's a, what's called maleic anhydride. It's a double bond, and then there are sort of two carbonyls and then a bridging oxygen. Um, or there's a ketone here and a double bond here. Notice all of these participate very readily in this reaction. Um, and they're all forming, notice what I've drawn over here. The blue carbons come from the diene. The red carbons are the carbons from the dienophile, and the green bonds here are the new single bonds which are formed. So we have the uh, same kind of process if you think about shifting the electrons like this and forming those bonds, you would get this, this structure. Okay, six member ring with one double bond left. That double bond is in the middle of the portion which came from the diene. Okay. And this ester group up here. No, and I want to focus on this ester, the nitrile, it's still there as well. Um, these groups, you notice some commonalities here. These this works really well when you have at least one, two is better, uh, groups which we which are electron withdrawing. Okay, so if you have a carbonyl group, like a CO double bond, uh, the polarization of that bond is in this direction. So if I just look at maleic anhydride, those, are, those oxygens are, are more towards the more electronegative oxygen. Okay, the same thing here. Uh, the bond is polarized towards that oxygen. So this is partially positive. This is what we refer to as an electron withdrawing group, EWG, I abbreviate everything, electron withdrawing group. So one of the important features is that your diene be electron rich and your dienophile or the double bond which is reacting being electron deficient. So electron withdrawing groups help to make this, this pi system more electron deficient. Okay, so in a sense, although everything's happening at once, you can kind of think of the diene as a nucleophile, the dienophile, the double bond as an electrophile in terms of its reactive part. No, so you can do all kinds of things with this. You can make a single six-membered ring. If, some, if one of these is already in a ring, okay, like this double bond's already in the ring, that ring remains in the product. Now we make a bicyclic compound. This part was just hanging out for the ride. The double bond was where that red bond is. Okay? It's a really powerful method for making six membered rings. Uh, oh. Okay. Remember, I was talking about conformations of dienes? Well, this is a reaction where the orientation of the two double bonds is critically important. The reaction can only work, this particular deals all the reaction can only work uh, if we have this S cis conformation of the double bond. And that's because the reaction mechanism occurs where both bonds are being formed at the same time to make the ring. So, in the transition state, that bond and that bond have to be forming at the same time. Only if the two double bonds are oriented in this S-cis conformation is that possible. 
So if it's in the more extended form, okay, you could reach one end of, the, of a diene and a dienophile, but the other end is too far away. Okay, this has to rotate around in order to be able to form the other bond. So that can't, that doesn't work. Okay, so that confirmation is very important. Um, and so it is important to recognize that being able to form this S's confirmation is critical. There are some molecules in which this confirmation is so high in energy that it doesn't work very well as a, as a group to do this reaction. And we'll, we can look at some of those. So if we have a, a diene, um, let's say we have this diene, right? What happens if I have substitution on it? What if I had a cis double bond on one of those? Notice this is cis double bond. That makes it even more crowded, right? What if I had two CH3s there? Okay, that's going to be extremely crowded. It would rather be, I have some more pictures on the other end, it would rather be in the open form, but it can't react and it deals all the reaction that way. That's why it is important to recognize the differences in energy. So here are some examples, and it completely depends on the orientation and the stereochemistry of your alkenes. So if we look at these two examples of, these are hexadienes, okay? Hexadiene. So if both of the double bonds, if both of the double bonds have the substituents on the double bonds trans, right? In the open form, it looks like this. If you rotate around the middle bond, the large series three groups are pointed out. Okay, that's not that bad. That actually is possible to use this to do deals all the reaction. Although that's higher in energy than the conformation on the left, it's not too crowded in here. Okay. If on the other hand you take the CH3s and both of these double bonds are cis. I think I have a typo in the notes on this too. Cis cis. I think I said cis trans, but cis cis. Right? Uh, it prefers this open form. If you rotate around that single bond in the middle and you get to this, these are way too crowded. It's just so much higher in energy that it can't adopt this conformation to do the Diels Alder reaction. So that molecule won't participate it would be nearly impossible to do a deals alder reaction with that. Okay? Um, some molecules are fixed and can't move at all. If you look at these, here we have a system where we have two double bonds, which are fixed in a ring and forced into one conformation only. So if you look at this blue, this has the S-cis conformation of the diene, okay? That orientation. Whereas if the double bonds were in opposite rings, there's no way it can even rotate, right? They're just fixed there and stuck. Um, most often when you look up Diels-Alder reactions, what you'll find is that this molecule, cyclopentadiene, that molecule is one of the best dienes to do a Diels-Alder reaction with. Um, it is in the right conformation, and it is reactive enough. It's somewhat strained because of the five-membered ring, and it has a certain amount of reactivity to it that makes it ideal for doing deals all the reactions. As a matter of fact, um, cyclopentadiene. If you, you can't buy cyclopentadiene like that, it doesn't. It, if you if you leave cyclopentadiene sit in the bottle for a day or two, it actually reacts with itself. It doesn't deal with all the reaction with itself. Um, so what we actually buy is a, a dimer. It dimerizes. So if you, let me just draw this. If you take this as a diene, and you react that with another cyclopentadiene, just one of the double bonds, okay? Actually, maybe, well, that's okay. Use blue here. 
and then you do the reaction. It actually dimerizes to form what we call dicyclopentadiene, which looks like this. So dicyclopentadiene is basically the deals all their product of two double bonds of one of the cyclopentadiene and one double bond of another. Um, fortunately, what we can do is this is stable, but if you just, just heat this up and distill it, it breaks apart and does the reverse of the deals all the reaction. And uh, like I said, it's stable for a little while, but after a day or two, you start to, it starts to dimerize back, which is an interesting observation. Notice this is a pretty complicated structure, right? We have the six-numbered ring, which I've tried to draw in some kind of conformational way here. Uh, we have a the CH2 group, which ties the ends of the two double bonds together. That's bridging between them, and then the other ring here. Uh, these kinds of bridged cyclic molecules, um, very common when we use this as a reactant in a deals alder reaction. And I'm going to show you some more examples of that. Uh, here's, a, here's an example of cyclopentadiene reacting now with a, a different um, dienophile, an alkene. Notice the reaction occurs uh, exactly the same as uh, I showed for the other systems. Okay, you can think about electrons flowing in that way. Here's the transition state where we have these two bonds forming. The only difference between this and the examples I showed before is that there's a bridge in between the two ends. That's all. That has to go somewhere. It's still there in the product. Notice what I've drawn in, in sort of a more flat way is the six-membered ring of the product. And then with the CH2 group bridging in between coming up, this is just hanging out there, so that's still there also. Um, you'll, you'll, you'll see it commonly drawn in that flat way, but if you look at a more conformational drawing of this, this is a, a little bit better in terms of what it looks like shape-wise. The, notice the six-member brain here, because of this bridge, has to adopt a bold conformation. And that's okay, it's the only thing it can do. Um, I just want to point out, notice where the bonds are forming. The new bonds are forming to the two carbons, the two ends of the double bond here. Don't get confused about this, this bridge that's right there. Um, also, dienophiles can be other things besides just alkenes. They can be triple bonds as well. Notice this molecule has a CN triple bond. This is an electron withdrawing group also. It helps. With a triple bond, it will participate in the deals alder reaction also. The difference is that um, since this already has two pi bonds to it, one of them reacts and disappears. You're still left with one double bond. Okay, but that's also a very useful uh, way to do this kind of cycle addition. Um, I think uh, let's see what's next. Okay. Uh, I just want to show you um, a video of this reaction occurring. This is the reaction I've shown above. This is showing how this reaction occurs. It's a model. And notice in this process, we have the diene here. And as the reaction forms, you form bonds to the end. The double bond here disappears. The double bond that was in these two end up in the middle. Okay, so you see how that happens? They come together. And the reaction occurs in one step, forming all the bonds at once. A pericyclic reaction because all six electrons in the pi bonds are all flowing at the same time. Okay, We're going to talk more about this. There are, there are a lot more details about this reaction that you need to know, and we'll cover that on Monday.